All right. Well, hey, happy Friday, everybody. Um, today's plan is to continue talking about applications of Diffie Qs. We're going to look at what we call mixture problems, and then we're going to start doing some physics. And specifically, we're going to take into account air resistance for the first time ever. Finally, we've got the math that allows us to um, not just ignore it. So we'll, we'll talk about a couple of different ways that we can do that and how it um, and what it entails when it comes time to solving the equation. So uh, that's my plan. But before we go down that route, um, any questions about any of the homework or anything else we've talked about so far? Um, no specific questions about any problems, but I did see that there were five sections on there. And are we up to date with all of those as of right now? Uh, I believe that we will be after today. I, th I think we're still on pace, actually. Um, we had gotten a little bit ahead of pace, and then um, we, we lost that ahead by not having class on Wednesday, but I think we're still good. So um, I'll definitely check that, though, after class to make sure that I'm not having you guys do homeworks that we haven't talked about. All right, so it doesn't sound like there are any other big questions here. So I'm going to go ahead and hop up to the whiteboard and we'll tackle some of these other applications. So I'll be right back. All right, so I, I showed you a few examples last time that had to deal sort of with exponential growth. We talked a little bit about like population modeling and then we did Newton's law of cooling. Um, but I wanna share with you a couple more big types of problems that lead to differential equations. And the first one are what we call mixture problems. Now, just so you know, my language for this, and, and I think Larry's actually the same if you chat with him, um, I call these pond problems. Because one of the classic examples is a pond that's being polluted. We'll do one of those. Um, so you'll hear me say pond problem, but it really is just a mixture problem. And here's the setup for a mixture problem. What we've got is some sort of a container, right? So, you know, a pond, um, you know, a tank of water, you know, whatever. So we've got some sort of a container that is getting filled or um, where we've got something entering it that's got pollutant, salt, some sort of a, a solution in it. And it's also being removed at the same time, but it's mixing. And what we're looking for is the change in the concentration of the salt, the pollutant, the you name it. All right. And so mixture problems really, I, I draw a picture for them because you know me, I like my pictures. Um, but basically, what we're going to have is some sort of a container. They're always going to look like this, even if they're a pond. We're going to have something that's coming in and then something that's leaving. All right, so let me just go ahead and like read to you an example of one so you know what I'm talking about. So um, here, here's the setup. So suppose that we've got a thousand liters of water here. So I got a tank that holds a thousand liters of water. And in there are 20 kilograms of salt. But we're actually introducing salt water and we're removing water from the tank so that the water level doesn't change, right? So basically, if we put in, you know, um, 10 liters of new salt water, we're going to lose 10 liters of the mixture. And the question is, can we create an equation that tells us how much salt is in the tank? And then can we use that to figure out, like, a limiting value? How much salt are we going to have over time? So this is a kind of a classic mixture problem. Now, where the differential equations will come in here is if we think about this as there's stuff flowing in and flowing out, um, 
there's going to be a change in our concentration. So let's say Q is the thing that we're interested in. It's the amount of salt. It's the amount of pollutants. It's the amount of whatever in a mixing problem. <coughs> what we know is the change in that is going to be due to whatever's coming in. So I'm going to put here rate in minus what's leaving. And so we'll just say rate out. So salt's coming in, but salt's also leaving, right? Because no matter how salty this water is, some of that's going to be leaving as time goes on. And this is what's going to lead to our differential equation. Just by looking at how much is coming in versus how much is going out, we'll see the change in our quantity. So let me take that example that I just kind of read to you and show you how we can set this up. All right, so here's what we've got going. Let's say we've got a thousand liters of water that currently has 20 kilograms of salt. Okay, so it's got 20 kilograms of salt that's been dissolved in it. We're going to be pumping water in. Um, but this water is going to be containing 0 0.2 kilograms per liter. It's flowing in at a rate of 5 liters per minute. And then we're going to put here the well mixed solution is being drained at the same rate. So we're going to do two things. The first question, so I guess this will be part A. Part A is going to say, is going to be find a formula. For the amount of salt in the tank, and I'm going to put here with respect to time, because that's really what we're curious about. And then part B is going to be, what is the limiting value in terms of this salt? So. I'm going to put here, what is the limiting amount of salt? OK, so I know you're probably looking at this going, I'm never going to have to deal with a salt water solution. Who cares about this? This is just an example for any kind of a mixture problem. And mixture problems can happen even when it's not liquid. You can think of money as a mixture problem. I've got my bank account. I'm putting money in. I'm taking money out. Right. So it actually applies to any kind of situation where you've got a rate in minus a rate out. And I'm sure that you can imagine lots of those situations. But we'll use this one to kind of model how to construct the differential equation so that you can apply this to other things. All right, so on our picture, the way to think about this, um, first of all, the, the 1,000 liters and 20 kilograms. The 20 kilograms, what that tells us is that at the beginning, Q of 0 is equal to 20. So Q is going to be the amount of salt, not a concentration, but just the actual amount of salt. So we're going to have 20 kilograms of salt. So Q of 0 is going to be 20. All right, the water containing 0 0.2 kilograms per liter, that's the stuff that's flowing in. So let's see if we can create our equation for this scenario. All right, so let's go to the Q prime is equal to rate in minus rate out. 
Okay, so let's think about how much salt is coming in. All right, well, we know that the water contains 0 0.2 kilograms per liter, and it's coming in at five liters per minute. So how much salt is coming in every minute? How many kilograms of salt come in in one minute? Five liters. Okay, so five liters is how much water is coming in. 0 0.2 times five. Okay, thanks, Victor. So we'll go ahead and multiply those guys together. 0 0.2 times five would be the actual amount of salt that's coming in, right? So if we've got 0 0.2 kilograms per liter, and that's coming in at five liters per minute, if we multiply those together, that's actually going to give us the number of kilograms per minute. All right, so every minute we're going to get one more kilogram of salt. At least one more kilogram is getting put in, but we're losing some at the same time. So we need to think about how much salt are we losing? Well, we want to do kind of the same idea. We want to look at how much salt is there per in the water, and then at what rate is it leaving? Okay, well, we were told that it drains at the same rate. So that means whatever concentration we have, we're still going to multiply that by five liters per minute. So the question is, what's the concentration in the tank? Right, we need to know how much salt there is in terms of kilograms per liter. Well, let's start with the how much there is in terms of the volume. We know it's a thousand liters of water, right? And as time goes on, it stays a thousand liters because we got five liters coming in and five going out. So we'll put a thousand down here for a liter. But how many kilograms of salt are in the tank? There are 20, right? Okay, well, it starts as 20. Yeah, it's changing. But it's changing, right? Okay, so it's actually not constant. So it's a variable. But that variable is Q, right? Remember, that's what Q stands for. Q is how much salt is in the tank. So the concentration in the tank is just going to be whatever that Q is divided by 1,000. So if I simplify this a little bit, this gives us Q over 200. And so this is the differential equation that describes the scenario. The change in the amount of salt is due to the one kilogram that's coming in every minute minus however much is flowing out, which is due to the concentration on the inside. Okay? As it gets saltier, we lose more salt. Or if it gets less salty, we lose less salt. But the, the amount of salt that leaves is dependent upon how much is in there at the start. So in order to build this, I want you to notice what we did. We multiplied these two quantities together. And for each one of them, it was a concentration times the rate. Right? It was the concentration of salt in that times how fast it was flowing. And the same thing over here, the 0 0.2 kilograms per liter was the concentration in the water coming in times the rate at which it came. And that's pretty standard, actually, when you do a pond problem. Um, you're going to end up multiplying concentration times rate.
All right, well, there you go. There's the differential equation that we need to solve. Um, so tell me how you want to solve this one. What method do we need to use for this guy right here? We could just integrate both sides. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do that just right now because the DQ is over here and the Q is on the other side. No, we, we need all the Qs in one side. All right, can you say that again, Victor? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. We can separate it, maybe. Okay, so it, but it's definitely separable. We could bring this stuff over to the other side. So we could solve this um, using separation. That's not how I actually want to do it, though. I want to solve it using the linear methods. I think, I think this might be a little bit faster. Recognize that this is a linear differential equation, linear first order. If I move that Q over 200 over, I get Q prime plus Q over 200 equals 1. And the reason I want to do it using the linear methods is look at the functions that I'm going to have to integrate. They're all constants. So this will actually be really, really quick in terms of solving it. So it's a non-homogeneous. So we'd start with solution to the homogeneous. Uh, we called it y1. I'll go ahead and continue to call it y1. But it's going to be e to the integral of negative 1 over 200. OK, well, that's nice and easy. So we get e to the minus 1 over 200t. So then we need to get our u. u is just going to be the integral of 1, this function, over the y1. Well, the negative exponent brings that to the top. So we're integrating 1 over e to the 1 over 200t, which is going to be 200 e to the 1 over 200t plus c. So then we just go ahead and multiply this u times that y1. And what we get is that q is equal to 200 plus c e to the minus 1 over 200 t. So there's our general solution. And had you done separation of variables, you would have gotten exactly here. I, I just think this is a little bit faster. OK, so now let's get our c value using the initial value. So um, since we know that q of 0 is 20, we're going to get 20 equals 200 plus c e to the 0. Well, e to the 0 is 1. That's a pretty quick solve to get c equals minus 180. And so that gives us then as our solution, q equals 200 minus 180 e to the negative 1 over 200t. So this function actually is going to tell us how much salt is in that tank after any number of minutes. Right? You plug in 0, you get 20. So we started with a 20 kilogram. But if you want to know how much salt is going to be there in 10 minutes, plug in 10, you're going to get a number. You're going to get, and that's going to be in kilograms. And that's going to be the number of kilograms of salt in the tank. What would we have to do in order to change the unit of time, say, from minutes to hours? Um, if you wanted to do that from minutes to hours, uh, you would have converted these things to hours. So it would have been mm. liters per hour. So you would just have to multiply by 60 in this case. So you would have had 0.2 kilograms per liter and then 300 liters per hour. 
And the same thing over here, you get to make that a 300 meter per hour. But you can convert them to any units you want. I mean, if we wanted to make this so that it wasn't kilograms, for some reason, we want to convert it to pounds because, you know, America or whatever. Um, then, yeah, you could do the same thing. You go, well, instead of 0.2 kilograms per liter, that's, well, divide that by, what was it, 2.2, I think. And that would tell you the number of pounds per liter. And, you know, so if you want to convert to anything else, it's just a matter of multiplying by that conversion factor. Um, you just need to make sure that when you put this together is the in minus out, that the units on these two match. You know what I mean? Like you don't want, say, this first one to be in liters per hour and the other one to be in liters per minute. That's going to be a problem. Then you're not going to, then it's not going to work out. So does that make sense? Or yeah. did I answer your question really is what I'm asking? Yes, you did. Yeah, OK. All right, well, cool. So now we've got it. We've got the equation. And even better, now we can actually answer that second part. Remember, the second part was, what's the limiting value? Like, how much salt is going to end up in the tank? Because this isn't always clear. You know what I mean? Like, think about it. We're, put, we're pumping salt in, and we're always pumping salt in. And so you might start thinking, well, then there's going to be an infinite amount of salt in. But obviously, at the same time, we're removing some salts. Um, but it does turn out that there's a limiting value. Check this out. What happens if you take this and you go to infinity? What's the limit of this as you go to infinity? Going to be zero. So the part with the e to the minus whatever, that's going to be zero. But we're actually subtracting that from 200. So it's actually 200 is the limit. So if we just let this go, as we approach infinity, so as time goes on, this tank starts getting closer and closer and closer to 200 kilograms of salt. So there's actually a max. It's not going to get, to, I mean, technically, it's not going to even get to 200 kilograms. But it, it will, right? But it's going to be at 200 kilograms. So now that one might feel a little trippy. You might be going, wow, that, that feels wrong. Um, but here's what I want you to look at. Think about what is the concentration when we're at this point? When we get to Q equaling 200, you know, what, what is the concentration salt per liter? All right. So if we actually look at the concentration of this, It's going to be 200 kilograms per that thousand liters. Which is 0 0.2 kilograms per liter. What you might recognize was the rate at which the salt is coming in. So what's going to end up happening with this tank eventually is its concentration is going to be the same as the concentration that's coming in to it, because it's losing salt at exactly the same rate as it's gaining it at that point. OK, so this is kind of a classic mixture problem, where we look at the rate in minus the rate out. but. I do have to give you another example, because this one has a feature that makes it way easier than the next one I'm going to show you. So I definitely need to show you this next one. But before I do that, let me answer any questions you have here, because I'm sure there probably are a few. And my bet is that the questions are not about solving the differential equation. Hopefully they're not. Hopefully you get to this point. And you're like, okay, I know what I need to do. The key is getting it set up. 
So let's practice another one to help us with that setup. All right, so this is going to be a similar kind of deal. And this time it is going to be a pond. And there's going to be a pollutant that's going into it. So um, here, here's our setup. So suppose that we have a pond. that initially contains 500,000 gallons and this is going to be fresh water. And so we'll, just, we'll just say it's clean water. Okay, so there's a stream that flows in. At a rate of 12,000 gallons per day. That also contains two grams per gallon of jet fuel. So we're by an airport. The airport has a big underground tank that holds the jet fuel. But that tank is leaking. And it's getting into the into the water source. And so this stream that's flowing in contains this jet fuel. Okay. Now there's also going to be a stream that leaves the pond. With a flow rate of 10,000 gallons per day. And so we're going to actually answer the same two questions. Okay. There's going to be the find the formula. For the amount of jet fuel in the pond. And then part B is going to be what is the limiting value. So I'll give you a second to, to write that all down and then we'll attack this problem. All right. So let's see if we can do this. And uh, notice that, it, again, it's, it's another mixture problem. It's another pond problem. So as promised, here's my pond. Then I've got a stream that's flowing in. And I've got a stream that's flowing out. So we're going to set this up exactly the same way. We want to look at Q prime. And again, Q prime is going to be equal to the amount in minus the amount out. So let's set it up exactly the same way. So coming in, we've got 12,000 gallons per day that contain two grams per gallon. So we're going to take the two grams per gallon. And we're going to multiply that by 12,000 gallons per day. So that's going to end up being 24,000 grams per day.
right? So exactly the same thing that we did before. All right, so now let's figure out how much we're losing. All right, well, it's the same thing. We want to go ahead and take concentration times the flow rate. Um, so where was it? Uh, stream leaves a pond with a flow rate of 10,000 gallons per day. All right, so we're going to have something times 10,000 gallons per day. So then we need the concentration of the pollutant in the lake. All right, we'll go back to that example with the salt water. Remember what we did is we took the amount of salt and we divided it by the amount of water in the container. Same idea, we're gonna take the amount of pollutant and divide it by the amount of water. All right, so the amount of pollutant is Q. And how much water is in the lake? 500,000. All right. It's got 500,000 originally. Yeah. But this is the difference with this one. At this point, you may have been going, well, this feels exactly the same as the other problem. Like, what's the difference? Here's the big difference. Notice the flow rate in and the flow rate out are not the same. We're pumping in 12,000 gallons every day and we're losing 10,000 gallons every day. So that means that the volume of this pond is actually increasing. Okay, so this is where it gets a little bit more complicated because yeah, it started at 500,000, but that 500,000 is increasing. So how much extra water are we getting every day? 2,000 gallons? Yeah. Yeah. 2,000 gallons. If you look at the difference, 12,000 minus 10,000 is 2,000 gallons. So this is actually going to be Q over 500,000 plus 2,000 T. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and simplify that. I'm just going to divide everything by 1,000 just to make life a little bit easier. I'm going to make this 10Q over 500 plus 2T. But again, it's gallon or grams per day. So our units match up, which is now our T are in days and, and our concentration or our quantity is in grams. Okay, so you got to watch out for this. When you get into a situation where the flow rate in is different than the flow rate out, your concentration for the pond itself or the container itself will vary with time. All right, so this is one where it's increasing in volume, but it had it been reversed, like let's say it was coming in at 10,000 and out at 12,000, the only difference is this would have been a minus because we're losing 2,000 gallons per day. So in this scenario, our pond is actually getting bigger. And that happens, right? I mean, we, we see that in the lake, that the lake, uh, the volume of the lake goes up sometimes and it goes down sometimes, it just sort of depends. So um, in the real world, this is actually much more common than the flow rate in is equal to the flow rate out at least in non-man-made circumstances. All 
All right, well, let me rewrite this differential equation up here. So we've got Q prime. I'm going to go ahead and move the bit with the Q over here. So 10 over 500 plus 2T times Q equals 24,000. But again, notice that this is linear first order. So we can go ahead and solve it using the same methods as we've done before. Um, this is one that's not separable. So even though the other example I just showed you, we could have used separation on, this one we can't. This one we definitely have to use the linear methods. But it's still not terrible especially since the non-homogeneous part is just a constant. So those tend to be a little bit easier. Um, but we would attack this the same way, right? So y1 is going to be e to the integral of negative 10 over 500 plus 2t. All right, so that ends up being e to the 5 times the natural log of 500 plus 2t. So we can bring that 5 in as a power. The e to the natural log cancel each other out. And we're left with 500 plus 2t to the fifth. So there's our y1 not y prime, one, up. All right, so now let's get our u. So u is going to be the integral of 24,000 over this. All right, well, that's a nice, simple power rule kind of thing. Right, think of this as to the minus five. So um, we can integrate that. And we're going to get 500 plus 2t to the minus four. And I believe that's a minus 3,000 times that. And again, plus C. So we can multiply our Y1 times this, and we get Q is equal to minus 3,000 times 500 plus 2T plus C times 500 plus 2t to the fifth. Oh. Oh, I made a mistake. Anybody see where I went wrong? I hate when I do that. I forgot something. What did I forget? The non homogeneous part? Got that stupid negative sign. Which changes everything. Son of a biscuit. I hate minus signs. All right, so this is then the integral of 24,000 
times 500 plus 2t to the fifth. I mean, it, it's actually just about as easy of an integral. Um, but uh, that's going to end up giving us, I think it's 2,000 times 500 plus 2t to the sixth. So that then when I multiply these together, we get Q is equal to 2,000 times 500 plus 2t plus C over 500 plus 2t to the fifth. I mean, I meant to do that on purpose to remind you to be very careful and watch your signs. And I, I'm not going to bullshit you like that. You guys know by now. But notice how different this is, right? Without that minus sign. I'm, I'm curious. Um, the last one we did, the flow in was the same as the flow out, and we got exponential decay. But in this one, we don't. Is it because it's increasing in volume? I, well, it's it's because it's changing in volume. We would have actually gotten something very similar, even if it had been decreasing in volume. Um, just these would have been 500 minus 2t, 500 minus 2t. It wouldn't have changed the form of the integral. It still would be a natural log. It just would have changed the sign on it out front. So it would have given a similar structure, um, but it wouldn't have been exponential. What dictates whether or not it will be exponential? Is it just the fact that the flow rate in and out is changing? Uh, yeah, it, it's well, okay. So mathematically what's dictating it is the P function isn't constant. The p function here has t in it, and that's what's leading it to not being exponential. If this is just a constant, then you'll always get an, an exponential growth piece to it. So that, that's what's driving it. And so then what made this not constant was the fact that flow out was not equal to flow in. OK, that makes sense. So I, I think it's better to recognize the mathematical driver, which was this wasn't constant. And then you can go back to the problem and go, oh, OK, this is why that function wasn't constant. Because it's it's possible that that function is not constant for another reason. You know what I mean? Like if we ad adjust the scenario somehow um, so that there isn't a flow rate difference, but something else that leads to that not being constant, it will lead to similar issues. But good question. I like that one, Bradley. Thank you. All right. So now we got to find C. Well, I think at this point, you guys don't really care, but um, <laughs> you probably didn't care a while ago. But, uh, let's at least get uh, figure out what C should be. Um, so the question is, what's our initial value? Because we didn't write it down. What was Q of zero? So think about what that's asking in words is Q is the amount of pollutant. So how much pollutant was in the lake at the start? I guess none. Yeah, it was none. Remember, it was fresh water. Everything was nice. There was no pollutant. So Q of 0 is equal to 0. All right, well, so that's going to give us 0 equals 100,000 plus C over 500 to the fifth. <laughs> that's going to be a really, really, really big number. 
so C is going to equal, let's see, five to the fifth, 3125, 10 to the 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So if we move the decimals, I think this is minus 3.125 times 10 to the minus 19. Very small number. But if we put that back into our C, I'll just erase this real quick. So I'm going to use minus 3.125 times 10 to the minus 19. Why can we not count that as zero? Um, because it's not. <laughs> I mean, okay. It, do you want to talk to the mathematician, or do you want to talk to the scientist? Okay. Well, you just answered it by that right there. Right. <laughs> Because the mathematician's going to say, well, that because this is the answer. Mm -hmm. And then the scientist is going to say, well, I mean, depending on what I'm doing, calling that zero might be fine. And really what that's going to, where that's going to matter is like the time scale. Mm, okay. Right? Because if yeah. we're on a really small time scale versus a big time scale, small time scale, I might need to worry about that. Mm -hmm. but a large time scale, yeah, and I don't care about that whatsoever. Right? Yeah. In fact, if we were to look at this now and go, okay, well, how much pollutant is there going to be eventually? You know, limit as t goes to infinity. Well, this piece with this fraction is going to die out anyway. Right? As t gets bigger, I, I don't care what this number is on top. This bottom number is going to end up driving anything, everything anyway. Um, but if you look at this piece, this piece actually goes to infinity. So it turns out that this is going to actually just get more and more and more and more polluted. But that should kind of make sense. Why is the amount of pollutant in this going to grow without bound? There's nothing stopping it. Yeah, the, the pond itself just keeps getting bigger. Right? We're, we're not removing, we can't be removing as much pollutant as we're putting in because we're not removing as much water as we're putting in. And the concentration in the pond can't be greater than the concentration of what's flowing in because there wasn't any in the pond to start with. Right. And you can see why there's a limitation to this model anyway. If we were to look at this model and go, okay, well, let's use it. Um, this is saying that the pond's going to grow forever, which cannot happen. So even this as an example of where we can use differential equations still has its limitations in the real world. Uh, oh, you're right, Ralph. That one should be positive. It was the negative out front. Thank you. Good catch on that. And then both the scientist and the mathematician say, oh, I definitely am not going to forget about that. Thank you, Ralph. Another mic. Man, that's two minus signs that I've botched in this one example. Clearly, it's Friday, right? Weirdly. At least it was the same example and not others, right? Yeah, I, we'll, go, we'll go with that. It doesn't, it doesn't help my pride at all. All right. Well, anyway, so classic mixture problem, classic pond problems. Just watch out for, again, the reason I showed you this one was that the difference that it led to 
where that P of X was not a constant. It was variable with time, which forces, A, it forces us to do the linear method. Um, and then B, it gives us a completely different structure. All right, so um, even though we're starting with the same kind of idea, it can lead to a very different type of solution. All right, so mixture of problems. So any other questions on this one before we step off of it and go to another type of scenario that leads to differential equations? All right, so here you go, the one you've been waiting for. The one you've been waiting over a year for. Let's take air resistance into account. Let's quit going with the nonsense. Oh, we toss something in the air and we don't have to worry about air resistance. Okay, we're not on the moon, right? We're not on the moon. We have an atmosphere. How do we deal with that? Well, what we're gonna do is uh, basically make another assumption. Oh no, another assumption. We're gonna make another assumption that at least is closer to reality. It doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that this assumption always applies, but here's what we're gonna do to at least account for air resistance or drag. Um, let me just do this. So we're gonna do air resistance on a falling body. So let's actually just start easy. I'm just taking this pen and I'm dropping it. All right, now there's going to be air resistance. If, if we draw a force diagram on something that's falling, you're going to have your gravity that's pulling it down. But there's also going to be air resistance. And, and I'm actually just going to call it drag. Um, I think Bradley asked about this last time, but he may have asked off the record. Uh, I'm not really sure. but. Um, we'll call it air resistance, call it drag, you can call it friction. Um, there, there are lots of things that, that that goes by. But basically, yeah, it, it's a it's a drag force. It, it's slowing us down. It's trying to fight gravity. That's why, you know, things like pieces of paper just sort of flutter down, right? Because there's stuff fighting gravity. All right, so this is what it looks like. Now, here's the assumption that we're going to make. And this is actually a pretty decent assumption. But the assumption is going to be that the drag is proportional to velocity. So that just means the faster that the object falls, the more drag it's going to feel. Does that seem reasonable? Definitely. Right. I mean, again, next time you're, you know, driving or riding in a car, stick your hand out the window like this. When you're going slow, no big deal. When you're going fast, Right, you're going to feel that your hand's going to move because there's a lot more drag. So we're going to make this assumption. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a hell of a lot better than saying there is no drag. All right, so let's just do some real quick Newton's second law on this. So the total force then it's going to equal gravity minus drag. Right? Since it's falling, I'm going to make down be positive. If you don't like that, go ahead and make down be negative and then, or positive and, and, or down be negative and swap these. It totally works. 
Okay, so then um, the force is actually the mass times acceleration. Gravity, of course, is mass times gravity. And then our drag is now going to be some constant proportionality times velocity, because we're going to say that it's proportional to velocity. All right, so that's just good old Newton's second law. Um, and you're probably still wondering and waiting, where's the differential equation coming in? Well, it turns out this is the differential equation. Anybody see why? What can I do to this to convert it into a differential equation actually quite easily? Move the KV over. Okay, I will move the KV over, but remember for it to be a differential equation, I need a derivative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that one, the KV. <laughs> that one? All right, so think about this. We know about acceleration and velocity, right? Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So I can actually write this as m times v prime equals mg minus kv. And now this is a differential equation in terms of v. So if I rewrite this in the form that we're used to, we get here. And then um, you recognize that this is the linear first order. So I probably want to do one more thing just to make it the form that we want. Remember, it's best to have just a V prime by itself. So we'll divide by M. And so this differential equation now looks like V prime plus K over M times V equals G. So this is why we didn't tell you about it when you took first quarter physics. This is why we ignored air resistance, because you didn't have the math yet. If I threw this at you when you were just learning integrals, you'd have no chance. Right? But now we're ready. Now we can do this, because this is linear first order. Right? And we can even make this so that it's an initial value problem. We can say, like, all right, we've got the v of 0 equals v naught, which is all of v naught. Let's go ahead and solve this. And we'll leave all these letters in as k, m, and g. And then that way, we do it one time. We never have to, like, then we just have to insert the values. And it's not that terrible, right? If we go to the y1, the homogeneous solution part, it's going to be e to the negative integral of k over m, which is e to the minus k over mt. All right, and then we'll go to the u. Well, u is going to be the integral of g over e to the minus kmt, which is the integral of g e to the positive k over m times t. which just ends up being mg over k times e to the k over mt. So multiplying those together gets us that v equals mg over k. No, I forgot about plus c. Plus c e to the minus k over mt. So there's our general solution. And if we put in 0 for t and v naught for v, and we solve for the c and all that, let me just cut to the chase. We're going to end up with v equals, you're going to get v naught minus gm over k 
times e to the minus k over mt plus mg over k. So we'll go ahead and put a little box around that. And that now gives you the velocity of your object for any time. And again, going with the assumption that the drag is proportional to velocity. Looks a little bit different than without drag, right? Think back to the formula. Um, it was what my, V equals minus GT plus V naught. I kind of think that that's what that looked like. Um, it's considerably different. Without drag, velocity grows without bounds and it grows linearly. But look at what happens with drag. It's still going to grow. Right, because this is going to be non negative, so it, it's going to grow, but it's growing inverse exponentially or negative exponentially, which means it's flattening out. And in fact, what happens to this as time goes to infinity? What do you get in that formula if you let t grow without bound? mg over k. Yeah, just this constant part, which is mg over k. So it turns out that there's a maximum velocity that you're going to attain. Well, you know that by another name, probably. Have you ever heard of? Terminal velocity. Well, if you have, this is it. This is our terminal velocity. If you haven't heard of that, it's called terminal velocity because it's the velocity where you end, like you don't get any faster. So it turns out, like, let's say you jump out of an airplane. Hopefully you've got a parachute ready to open. Um, but if you just you know drop yourself out of an airplane, or okay, how about we just drop a baseball out of the airplane so no, so nobody gets hurt, except for the poor sucker that kicked the butt of baseball on the ground. Um, but if we drop a baseball, it's going to speed up as it's falling, but it's going to eventually reach a speed uh, a maximum speed. And it's going to be dictated by the mg over k. Right? And so there is a terminal velocity, there is a maximum velocity. Now, the question might be okay, so what exactly are the mg and the k? Let's, let's kind of remind ourselves. So g is gravity, m is the mass of your object. And then that k, that's going to be really a property of the medium. We could actually do the exact same thing if we were dropping something into a tank of water. Right? Drop a rock into the lake. Well, now instead of air resistance, there's going to be water resistance, drag due to water. But it's going to follow the exact same kind of structure. It's just that k value is going to be very different for the rock falling through water as opposed to it falling through air. I have a question for you. Sure. So you know how we see, you know, um, shooting stars, meteor showers, yep. um, things that are out in the vacuum of space that are getting pulled towards the Earth via gravity, they're going to speed up all the whole time until they reach the atmosphere. Yes. Um, okay. Are they going to speed up the whole time? Uh, their velocity will change the whole time. Yeah. I, I don't okay. know that they may not speed up because they might change direction. And in fact, okay. a lot of times, but yeah. Okay. 
And then once they do enter the atmosphere, that drag is what causes them to burn up because they're coming in at such a high energy level, right? Yeah, they're coming in super fast. So the drag produces um, all kinds of energy as heat energy. Mm, okay. Would it be possible that if you jumped out of an airplane and you somehow found a way, I, I don't think it could happen, but like you found a way to make yourself go faster than what your terminal velocity says, will you burn up? Okay. If you could get to a high enough speed, you would absolutely burn up. Crazy. No question about it. However, <laughs> however, um, you're not going to be, that's never going to happen when you fall out of a plane. Okay. Because uh, like, here's the difference. Here's really the big difference when you look at stuff like, you know, meteors or when they design like the space shuttle and, you know, the Apollo capsules and stuff, they have the heat shields and all that. Those things are moving at an incredibly high velocity initially, right? Before drag sets in where when you jump out of a plane, even if you thrust yourself downward, you're not like, you're not even close to those speeds. So think about what changes when you have a different initial velocity. And that, that, that's gonna be in this. So you're already gonna have like huge velocity and that great velocity is gonna lead to incredible amount of energy an incredible amount of work being done to slow you down. And that work is going to translate into thermal energy, which is just going to you know, erupt you into flame, basically. Um, so that it's not going to happen when you just jump out of an airplane because you're not going fast enough ever. Okay. So, um, but if there were a way, Oh yeah, totally. I mean, you can fire you can fire things out of like a gun that will end up um, burning up. I mean, bullets melt. The actual like the you know the the lead or whatever else that, that come out of some high speed rifle it melts as it's going. You know, and and that's the other issue is. You got to know what kind of thermal properties your object has. And some things um, burn easier than others or melt easier than others. Right. So, uh, but no, we, we don't have to worry about skydivers burning up anytime soon. Although that would be kind of crazy. I, I don't think people would skydive as much if that were a possibility. <laughs> All kinds of little uh, shooting stars that are people jumping out of airplanes. Anyway, um, I forgot what I was going to ask you guys. About. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So check this out. The terminal velocity. So we found it. We, we actually calculated velocity, um, got our terminal velocity that way. Um, turns out we could have gotten terminal velocity a lot faster if that's all we cared about. If all we cared about was the limiting value, we wouldn't have actually had to solve the entire differential equation. Because think about what terminal velocity means. That's the speed at which you don't go any faster. So once you reach terminal velocity, what's your V prime? Zero. It's zero. OK, well, remember this equation right here? What if we let V prime equal zero? So you get zero equals mg minus k times V. What do you get if you solve that for V? Mg over K. Uh, so if all you're looking for is terminal velocity, you don't actually care what the formula is for velocity. You can get your terminal velocity much faster. All right, but we probably actually do care about velocity. Because think back to physics, what we really are concerned with is actually not the velocity, but the position of the object, right? 
how high is this, you know, what, what is the, the height of this object as it's falling? Well, how are you going to get that? How do we actually get a position function? We integrate our velocity function. Yeah, there you go. So we take that thing that's in that red box up here. We integrate that and we would get our position. I'm not gonna bother doing that because you know how to integrate, um, but it's actually a pretty easy integral, right? All this stuff is constant times e to a power. All right, e to a power, I can integrate that all day. And then this other piece is just a constant. Cool, slap a T on it. Have to add on a plus C, but that plus C is gonna be um, related to our initial height. So it's actually pre a pretty quick, next step if we want to find actual position. Oh man, are you excited? You can now actually deal with air resistance? You should be. You, you physics types, engineering types should be really excited about having that opportunity now. We've got the tools, we've got the math that allows it. Um, but I want to come back to this assumption here that the drag is proportional to velocity, because that doesn't always pan out very well, um, because there are lots of other things that can affect it. But what's really beautiful is that you can change this. You can change this assumption. And as long as it's related to velocity, you're still going to get a differential equation. Right? You're still going to have your mv prime equals mg minus some function of v. Right? So this is what I'm getting at is if, if we just instead say, all right, there's going to be some sort of a drag function, call it f of v. Notice that this is still going to give us a differential equation. It's just not necessarily going to be linear. So here's another one that you'll often see where we go with, instead of drag being proportional to velocity, we might say, well, let's assume drag is proportional to the square of velocity. So that this turns into m times v prime equals mg minus kv squared. This is another one that we use a lot, um, just because it models cer uh, certain circumstances a little bit better. But the good news is, no matter what, no matter what f of v is, this thing is always separable. Right, take the generic form that I've got in the, on the second line here. I can rewrite this as uh, mv prime over mg minus f of v equals one. And remember, m and g are constants. So, Everything over here is just Vs. And now we can use separation of variables. And so like in a circumstance like this, it's going to lead to something where we're going to need to do um, partial fractions. So we could split this thing up because it's a difference of squares, basically. right? Um, so you can split that up and um, do partial fractions, then integrate, and you get your solution. It's going to be a very different looking solution, but that's because we're looking at our drag as in, in a different way. So I'm not going to bother going through the steps on this one, because again, you guys don't care. And I know you also know how to do it. So I'm not going to force you to sit through it. Um, but just notice that it's the same structure. 
It's just a different function. Um, but what I do want to do here is let's look at terminal velocity. Because we can actually figure out what the terminal velocity is without calculating, right? We'll do exactly the same thing where we let v prime equal zero. So if we do that, let's find the terminal velocity. V prime equaling zero gives us zero equals mg minus kv squared. And solving that for v gives us the square root of mg over k. So it's a different terminal velocity. It's very similar. And in fact, you can see why there's a square root, because now we're assuming that it's proportional to the square of velocity. Um, so, but this little trick to find the what happens as we go to infinity or what happens when like, we reach a, it's not changing anymore. Oh, uh, we do this all the time. We set that derivative equal to zero. And what that's giving us are equilibrium positions, right? Think about what equilibrium means. Equilibrium means everything's nice and balanced. And so when your derivative equals zero, that's an equilibrium. So that's a good trick just to remember. File that away. Uh, that, that's probably more the math brain likes to file away up in here. Oh, yeah, equilibrium. Q prime, V prime, Y prime equals zero, whatever. Right? And then you can find equilibrium value. All right. Anyway, so there's another example. Um, from physics, where we get differential equations that we can now solve. Um, there is one thing, though, that still some of you might recognize as potentially an issue with what we just did right here. Think back to your physics. There's another kind of assumption that I made. I didn't write it down. There's an assumption that I made that actually isn't always valid. Anybody see what it is? My guess is um, the K is constant. OK, that, that's actually um, not what I was going for, but that is another assumption. My that guess. The K value doesn't change, which um, Especially if we were going over like large distances, let's go back to your example, Bradley, of the, you know, like the meteors coming in. Um, because the, as the atmosphere thickens, your K value is going to change. So with altitude, K value will change. K value will also change with humidity levels, with temperature. You know, a, a lot of the things that we think of as um, that affect weather would affect our K. So that's actually good. I, I didn't even, I didn't think about that as an answer, but yes, the K value being constant, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I think, Victor, I heard you saying something. Yeah, I was thinking the gravity is not constant. Yeah, and that's where I was going. Gravity? is definitely not constant, again, especially over big distances. So if we go back to the, the meteor falling, you know, gravity that, you know, out on the very edge of the atmosphere is considerably lower. I mean, okay, considerably, it's like 9.79 or something like that instead of 9.81 meters per second squared. But that's sufficient enough that we would need to take that into account. Right, And I know not everybody here has taken physics, but gravity uh, depends upon the distance away from the center of the, the center masses, the, the center mass separation. And so as an object moves further away from Earth, let's say, so we send a rocket into space, as it moves further away, gravity decreases and it's an inverse square. It's a one over um, 
if we call that distance x, it's one over x squared. Um, and so if we want to start talking about that, like we're going to send a probe to, to Mars, right? We're going to send inside up to Mars. Um, you got to take that into account. Gravity not being constant throws stuff into whack as well, right? So just realize that there are still lots of assumptions that we're making. We've just eliminated the uh, worst assumption that we made when we first learned about projectile motion in physics, right? No air resistance is a horrible assumption. Gravity being constant, well, that's that's pretty good in lots of examples. I mean, if, if we want to talk about something that we, you know, are are throwing off the top of, you know, the Hard Rock Cafe, uh, Hard Rock Casino, yeah, gravity is constant all the way from the top of that down to the ground. That's not the kind of distances that we have to worry about. Even in an airplane, you go skydiving out of an airplane at, you know, at a couple thousand meters. We're not going to notice a gravity difference over a, say, 10,000 meter airplane height. 10,000 meters compared to the thousands of kilometers of the radius of the Earth, like, yeah, that's inconsequential. Okay. But when we start talking about launching something into space, then we'd have to worry about it. All right, well, I feel like I'm starting to preach, and, and I don't want to do that. Plus, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Um, you, you know how you said at the beginning of this, we're not on the moon? Correct. There will be air resistance? Yep. You know how people say the moon landing was fake? Yep. How the, how the hell are you going to fake dropping the, the feather and the, the hammer and hitting at the same time? How would you possibly fake that? Easy. You're in a vacuum chamber. Right, that they're wearing pressurized suits so they could be in a vacuum chamber on Earth. No. Nah. <laughs> we have. They exist. So your sound stage is built inside of a vacuum chamber. Dude, it's easy. Think for yourself. Quit being a sheeple. <laughs> right. No, I mean that that I've heard is you know what people's argument about that one is. But yeah, when uh, who was I think that was Alan Shepard when he dropped the, the eagle feather and the and the rock hammer, and they just perfectly side by side. Yeah, that that was that was pretty cool. I love that video. Yep, moon landing was faked, just like the Earth is flat. I'm quite certain. All right, well, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and call it a day. Um, so just some things to keep in mind. Don't forget on Monday, um, we do have some homework sets. I will check as soon as we're done. I'll check and see, make sure that there isn't anything due on Monday that we haven't talked about. Um, and uh, that will also make me see if we're on schedule anymore. But don't forget about doing those. Um, other than that, have an awesome weekend, guys. Um, get out there and enjoy yourself a little bit. Uh, don't just only do math. Do a little bit, but do other things too. All right. All right. So with that, uh, I will wish you all well and have an awesome weekend.